The Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church is a Christian people who believe Jesus is the Son of God, the hope of the world, who died on the cross to redeem us all for eternal life with God. Our purpose is to lift Jesus up and love people in. Visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. And now be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen to a Bible message by Pastor Ivan Blake. We're reading 2 Peter 1, 3 through 11. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ but if anyone does not have them he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins therefore my brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. And if and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. And you may recall that they read scripture last week as well. And that's because I've decided to talk twice on the same passage in the Bible because it has touched my heart so much. And so thank you again to, uh, to Angie, Sarah, and Laura for reading that scripture for us. And hopefully as you spend time this week on this passage, that uh, it's gotten deeper into your heart. And that's what it does when we go over it many, many times. I'm very grateful for uh, being able to use an outline that I heard another pastor speak about on this passage. So I, I, I want to just humbly acknowledge that very little that I preach is original with me. It is original from the Bible, and I believe the Holy Spirit has led me, but also in the research and reading, there's a lot of borrowing that goes on. Somebody said there is no original idea ever that has not been borrowed, and that is absolutely true even with preaching. So give credit to God if your heart is touched that he may do that for you. And uh, I'm going to invite you once again, please, to bow your heads with me. Dear God in heaven, we're so dependent on you to explain and to make real to us the Word of God. We are so excited to know that you are keen to do that. And so in our humble and simple way, we want to just open our hearts and minds that you can please speak as you only can speak. And that you'll touch as only you can touch. And that you will please apply as only you can apply these teachings, these principles from the Word of God. And I thank you for all who are watching and listening at this time. Thank you for your presence and for your holy word. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Boiling down this passage of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 11, gives me great delight to be able to say to you, as I read that passage, to be able to say to you that God is totally dedicated to getting you to spend eternity with Him in His home. God is entirely dedicated to that. There's no greater commitment that God has made than to get you to be with Him, to live with Him for eternity. And because that is true, this passage, Peter is reminding us over and over again of what God has done to make that possible. Peter says, that's why, because God is so committed, so dedicated to getting you, getting me into his kingdom, to live forever with him in his home, because of that, that is why God has chosen and called us. Another one that Peter says there, if you remember reading that passage and hearing it read, is that God not only chose and called us, but he called us to himself by his marvelous love, mercy, and grace. Another one is, because he's committed to getting us to live with him forever, 
That is why he has cleansed us from our sins, says this passage. That is why he has given us everything we need to live a godly life. That is why he has given us precious promises. It says great and precious promises that we can share in his divine nature. What more could God do? And he does all of that just so that he can give us a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now certainly, if that is God's priority, if he is so dedicated to doing that, you'd think and you'd know that we have the greatest incentive and the greatest opportunity and the greatest motivation then to work hard to provide the evidence that we are in fact his children and to, do, and, and to let no effort be left untried and used in order for us to show that we appreciate this great work that God has done for us, that we want to live a godly life. So just to, again, remind us what we mean by a godly life. And people can come up with all kinds of definitions, but the one that I have chosen from Scripture is when Jesus spoke in Matthew, actually it was Mark 12, even though he said it in, in Matthew as well, is to say that you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And he, then he said, even your neighbor is yourself. That's godly living. That's godly living. And yet when we think about these passages, this, these texts where it says that God is totally dedicated to getting us to live with him forever and that he has given us all those things to live a godly life, isn't it true that we still think about godly living as something terribly difficult? We're actually afraid of it. We may think even that godly living takes all the fun out of living. Do we perhaps stumble over these terms, godly living, because for us, well, that's for the super saint. Or maybe it's for us too, but only when we get to heaven, but not here in the here and now. Because it just seems to us that godly living is impractical, it's unfeasible, and it is just not possible in the here and now. And yet in Scripture, this passage tells us that that is absolutely incorrect. It tells us that God, God's plan is entirely different. It is possible. It is real. It is what God makes real for us. Godly living, Peter says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is possible, it is gradual, it is essential, it is personal, and it is wonderful. So what if the Holy Spirit has, been, has inspired Peter to write that? And even though it feels for us like it's a huge stretch, wouldn't it be a good use of our time then to give attention to what the Holy Spirit has inspired Peter to say and allow the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to our own hearts, not only of what God says, but what God does about what he says. So first of all then, let's look at how this passage tells us that godly living is indeed possible. It is possible. And let's look at the passage in the Bible in this, in this particular section in 2 Peter chapter 1, where this is in fact what Peter is saying. So we're looking at verses 3 and 4. If you don't have a Bible, let's um, watch it on the screen. But uh, by all means, see it in your own version, your own translation. Here it says, by his, tell me what it is, his what? Divine power. That's key. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need. Think possible. Think possible here. Everything we need for living a godly life. goes on, he says, he has given great promises that enable you to share his divine nature. These are astonishing words, really. Now, I don't know about you, but 
Let me ask you, how rich would you be if you had a dollar for every time you heard somebody say, it's impossible to change? How rich would you be if you had a dollar for every time you secretly thought of a, of a certain person, they'll never change? Or they thought about yourself, I cannot change. How rich would you be? But Peter says, don't let me hear you saying that you cannot be what God is calling you to be because look what he has given you. What more do you want? You don't need some esoteric knowledge. You don't need some mystical experience in order to live a godly life. It is so practical. It's so real, Peter says. It is possible. It is possible. Because if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and who he claims to be from God in the scriptures. If you believe all of that, and you've received him into your heart, you believe his gospel of saving grace, you've embraced that, then the assurance from the word of God is you've also been given his divine power so that everything you need is yours to live, to, to live a godly life. That's, that's how wonderful he is. We don't need anything beyond what the Bible is promised. It's almost like God has placed some spiritual DNA into our being so that that divine DNA now gets expressed through our entire lives all the time. God just makes that happen. God just makes that happen. You already have all you need to live as you know you should, as I know I should. We have that. And that does sound intimidating. It does sound scary. It does sound daunting. But here's the good news, that there is no wound in your life so deep that it cannot be healed. Choose to believe that. There is no brokenness so great that you cannot be repaired. There is no habit so binding that you cannot be freed from it. And so based on what this passage says, can you see why we come to the conclusion that living a godly life as God calls us to is indeed possible? And of course, the things that we tell ourselves are impossible will remain impossible. But if we say, it is possible, I choose to believe that it's possible on the basis of God's word, we will begin to believe God's word if we say that. Because God said it. So living a godly life is possible, but it's also gradual. And so look at that. You know, it immediately takes some pressure off your shoulders to know it's gradual, isn't it? Because, you know, God isn't saying you will fully live a godly life immediately right now. No, he doesn't do that. So look at the passage of Scripture here in verses 5 through 8. I've abbreviated it. It's not going to be this way in your Bible. So just for abbreviation, he says, because of these gifts, and we mentioned five of those gifts earlier on, because of these gifts that you have, do all you can to add to your faith in Jesus Christ, add goodness, add knowledge, add self-control, add patience, add devotion to God, add kindness toward the family of God, add love. And it's not like Peter was running out of things to say. Then he says in verse 8, if all these things are in you, and what's the key word now? Growing. Everyone say growing. See, that's, it's gradual because it's growing. You will never fall. You will never fail. If you take these things and they are growing in you. It's gradual. It's gradual. God's, God's life living through us develops, happens gradually. That takes a big burden, a big load off our shoulders, doesn't it? Yeah, but you know, the reason that we need to press this point that it is gradual and not sudden and not immediate, the reason why we have to press that point is because we live in a society, in a culture that doesn't do too well with patience. 
I mean, what happens when there's a brand new cell phone that comes onto the market? If you notice how it outsells all the other, except if it's an iPhone, it outsells all the other phones. Why does it do that? This new one. Well, they tell you it can, its processor is able to you know, speed up the, 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 the things that happen with that phone by three seconds. And we say to ourselves, I need those three seconds. It will transform my life to have three seconds extra. So we'll spend $800 for a new phone because, wow, we've got to have this thing that will make things happen quicker. That just illustrates what it's like in our lives, in our world. It, patience? That's for retirees. No, it can't be for them either because they say they're busier than they ever are. Is that an amen for that? Amen. Yeah, listen to all the retirees out there. Think about this, folks. You know what? We overestimate what we are able to do in a day. And we underestimate what we are able to do in a year or a lifetime. Let me illustrate that for you. You can break a huge slab of concrete with an acorn. Now you take this acorn to a building site where they have these huge slabs of concrete. And the thing not to do is to start banging on the concrete with the acorn because the acorn is going to split apart in no time and the concrete is not going to be touched. But if you take that acorn and you do what with it? You plant it strategically. You plant it where it should be. You see, there is a way. It's not a quick way, but there is a way for that acorn as it germinates, as it grows. You know, it takes decades for an oak tree to really get big. But in the meantime, as it grows, whatever gets in its way moves. It moves. Have you seen how that the asphalt in a parking lot, including our own church parking lot, raises, rises, breaks apart? And if you look around, there's an oak tree not far away. That acorn has got the power inside of it to break up a huge slab of concrete when it is planted in the right place. And it grows gradually, but unstoppably. That's the acorn. So let me ask you, is there a lack of radical change in your life, as I sense in my life? The kinds of changes that will make us more Christ-like in our living, with godly living? Is there a lack of that? Is there a shortage of that? Radical change. You may have worked hard at some things that change, but it doesn't change. It doesn't happen. And why is that? So the question I have to ask myself then, is that because I miss out on the astonishing possibilities of change over a long period of time when I feed the growth? When I feed the growth. Is that why I'm missing out on the radical change that God wants to bring about in my life? I'm either in too much of a hurry. Why can't God do it right now? It's important. It's good. There's nothing wrong with him changing me, so please do it now, God. Just imagine how good I can be for you, how much I can testify for you. And God says, no. Read your Bible. It says, wait on the Lord. And as you wait on the Lord, you're not sitting there with your arms folded. You know what you're doing? You're cultivating the gradual growth of the acorn, of the gospel, of the word of God, the character of Jesus, cultivating it gradually in your life. So I want you to watch this. First Peter now, chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes, I want you to see this coming up on the screen. As newborn babies desire the sincere or the pure milk of the word, some translations say, that you might grow. As newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word. Babies crave milk. So that you might grow into a full experience of salvation. Have you noticed babies don't grow suddenly? 
Now, we as parents, you know, we say, wow, it's six weeks already. Pastor James's little guy, Maddox, is six, and Jen's six weeks old now already. Bet you they are saying, wow, this baby is growing, growing, growing. And if you have family that haven't seen your children in a while, somebody told me the other day, it's 20 years since I've seen some of my family. Went to see them, and they keep saying, wow, how you've grown. <laughs> yeah. They saw it as a baby, now 20 years later. How you've grown. But it's a gradual growth. Basketball players don't suddenly shoot up to six foot seven overnight from babyhood. It's a gradual growth. And so godly living develops gradually. It's possible. It's gradual. But what else is it? It's essential. And here I want you to look at the text in verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, so dear brothers and sisters, work hard. A little uneasy with that little phrase. Work hard to prove. You know, I'm tired of being required to work hard to prove that I'm worth something. But that's not what it is saying here. Work hard to prove that you really are among God's, those that God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Now there's some people who very wrongly make this text to mean that you must work hard to become among the children of God, chosen and the elect. That you must work hard in order to be among those who are God's elect. That's not what the text says. The text actually says work hard to prove that you really are. You see, becoming a child of God, becoming a follower of Jesus, becoming a chosen called, belonging to God in his, in his family, adopted into his family, for that to happen doesn't require your hard work. It required the hard work of Jesus. So then why is he talking about hard work here? Well, once he gives you that privilege, that joy, that wonderful knowledge, the astounding reality that you are his child, you are permanently his child, that he won't give you up for anything. That he loves you with an everlasting love. When that begins to dawn on you and you realize that, you don't want to slacken in cultivating that relationship. You actually have incentive and motivation to work hard, to give the evidence that people will know, I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. What hard work will I do to provide evidence that I am called and chosen by God? What does that hard work look like? And I'm going to offer you this, and that is it is similar, it is very similar to the hard work that I show that I am serious about my relationship with my spouse or with a person that is very significant to me. There is work involved, hard work involved, to show how serious I am about that relationship. Now, that hard work is not always a drudgery, but sometimes it takes discipline, especially when to that person that I cherish so much, I need to apologize for being wrong. That's hard work. Have you noticed? That's why it doesn't happen often. It's so hard work. To admit that I'm wrong, to humbly come and say, I am wrong. And I need your forgiveness. I need you to help me with this weakness in me. That's hard work. But why, wouldn't I, why would I not do that for the one that I love with all my heart? And the one who loves me with all his or her heart. Why wouldn't I do that? So here are the things. I mean, you know what? If I don't work hard at that special relationship, it's going to die. It's going to die. So what do we do? Like with these earthly relationships, with people that are so significant to us, the same with that heavenly relationship with a God who has done so much for us, who loves us with an everlasting love. Let me say this. This is how we do it. It's the same thing. We cultivate that relationship with a growing communication skills. Cultivate that. 
And surely, if we have not grown in the way we communicate with the people that we have lived with, that we've related to closely, and we haven't grown in our communication with that person over the years, there's a real problem. We haven't worked hard enough at communication. Elvira and I decided as soon as we were married that it'll be a good idea for us to pick up some skills about communication within a couple. We weren't born with those special skills. So we went for training. We went to people who were putting on these seminars for couple communications and marriage enrichment and learned those skills. And, you know, 48 years later, we still practice those communication skills. The only thing is we need to practice them more and more because practice makes what? Perfect. So we haven't perfectly gotten there yet. I still have to often say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. So we do that, communication, grow in and deepen that communication with God. You know what that implies, you know what that means? And then be honest with what's going on inside of me, to be open with God, transparent with God, and have a real honest conversation with God about what's going on in the heart and in the life. Friends, that makes this relationship grow. And that is essential to doing in order to live a godly life. Do the things that are pleasing to the one who loves you so. That's hard work. Because it's not what you think pleases that person. It's what that person decides will please that person that I want to get in line with. To have godly living means that I also have to reject the temptations to be, dis, uh, to be diverted, to be distracted from my devotion to that person. And you know what that looks like in your earthly relationships as well as your heavenly relationship with God. Cultivate the habits that promote a healthy mind, that promote a healthy body, a pure mind, emotions that are stable. Cultivate those habits for the sake of your relationship with the people you are with and for your relationship with God. And above all, practice the presence of God. Like you practice the presence of the person you love the most in your daily life. You practice that presence. Does that make sense? You see, friends, this hard work yields wonderful results. And it's essential for living a godly life. Now, from being possible and or being gradual and being essential, it's also very, very personal. And next week, I'm going to spend all my time talking about this personal one. If you look at John chapter 14, the passages that have been assigned, we're going to talk about this personal relationship. You see, godly living is personal. And by personal, Peter means that growing in godly living flows from knowing Jesus, getting to know Jesus more and more. You never reach a full knowledge of Jesus. Look at the passage in the Bible, two of them, verse 3. He says, we have received all of this by coming to know him. There it is in red. It's personal, coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and, and excellence. Verse 8, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be, what? In your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can see the gradual growth in that knowledge of him. Now, please understand that knowing Jesus is not about information only. Yes, you need accurate information about who he is. But knowing him goes beyond information. It is relational. You don't know him until you relate to him on a personal way, in a personal way. You have relationships with a person when you spend time together and you do more than small talk. You do more than just the superficial conversations. You actually listen deeply and talk deeply, exposing your heart, the secrets of your life to one another. You get to know that person. And you begin to appreciate that person, to trust that person. You see, the one you get to know the best is the one you become like the most. That's why I want to spend a lot of time with my God. With the one who loves me so much. 
He's not standing there with a whip. He's not standing there with a checklist. He is standing there with his love pouring out over us. And he says, come to me. Know me. I want to reveal myself to you through my word in ways that will astound you if you'll just take the time. Knowing God. And that is why, you know, to get to know God, get to know Jesus, it's absolutely important to know the real Jesus. Not to spend the time getting to know someone who isn't really who that person claims to be. Now, I want to illustrate that. This is so important. I, 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 don't, want to, I don't want to underestimate this at all. We've got to get to know the real Jesus. And don't assume that Christians have got that right. The real Jesus. I was reading the other day a statement made by a very great Christian writer saying, that all the gods and the old gods of the Greeks and the Romans, they're a long time gone off, the, gone off the, the map. They've been discredited, they've been discarded. Very few people today will have Zeus in their house as a god that they bow before and worship. But in their place have come up other gods. So that ancient religions are making a comeback all over the world. To the extent where, because we have the media we have and the easy travel that we've had, and hopefully we'll come back again, because of all that, countries that used to, like the United States of America, had this one religion, which was called Christianity. And nobody would think that there is any other religion than Christianity that makes sense. Today, it's not like that. Because of travel, because of media, because of education, we now have what is called a pluralistic society. That means we have more than one system of belief, more than one religion, more than one way of thinking that are opposing each other, but they're all accepted as valid and equally true. Pluralism. That's so confusing. Do you know what that does with people's attitude about who Jesus really is? This author says this. Watch this. He says, we people, people today, they want, they want an easygoing amalgamation. That means bringing together of many religions. That's what people want today. They want a truce in interreligious competition. They want a mishmash of the best from all religions. But we Christians, here we're getting to the real Jesus. We Christians cannot surrender the finality and the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. Um, please say amen, somebody. We cannot surrender that, whatever the price. You see, there's simply nobody else like Jesus. This Jesus, in his incarnation, his birth, his atonement, his resurrection, has no parallels in any religion. And therefore, Jesus is the one and only mediator between God and the human race. The only. And this exclusive affirmation is strongly resented in our multicultural, pluralistic society today. It is resented. It is regarded by many as intolerant when you say Jesus and Jesus only is the Savior of the world. And yet the claims of Jesus compel us to follow him alone, however much offense it may cause. And it is doing that today, and it will increase. Because the battle that is being waged behind the scenes, and very often also in front of our eyes, is the battle between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. It's always the battle. So why would you have a personal relationship with an adapted, a morphed, a remade Jesus? No, oh, it is only the real Jesus, when you get to know him, that the gradual growth in godly living takes place. You've got to know the genuine before you can become the genuine. We need to study Jesus. 
Especially when there are so many confusing messages about Jesus in the world today. To know Jesus. To know Jesus. Godly living is personal with the real Jesus. But now, what is it? Godly living is possible. What's the other one? It's gradual. How about the third one? Essential. And when we've just done it is personal. The fifth one is, it is wonderful. Godly living is wonderful. Why do we say that? It's because the key to godly living is to live in awe, to be filled with awe and wonder, having your heart melted by the best news in all the world. To live in a state of wonder and awe of that best news. Here's the best news, verse 9. It says, But those who fail to develop in this way are short sighted, they are blind. They're not looking at something as wonderful as this, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their sins. If you're not growing, in godly living, ask yourself this. Have I forgotten how I was cleansed from my sins? Ask yourself, do I with amazement regularly think about the cleansing that Jesus brought about for me at such great cost? Is that what occupies my mind? Am I in awe of that? Do I with gratitude talk to God often about the wonder of His Huge sacrifice for me. Do I do that with wonder? Or do I yawn whenever I hear someone talking about that? You see, friends, if you do those things, the wonder of it all is going to change your life. Because godly living is wonderful. You will grow in godly living in the atmosphere of wonderment in what God has done with the greatest news in the world that is yours. Imagine, imagine being hit by the dreadful, dreadful regret that you have not lived in a way that showed that you were completely loved and accepted and favored by God. Notice what I said. Imagine being hit by the regret that you have not lived, I didn't say that you've not lived as you should live, I didn't say that. I've said with a regret that you haven't lived, with a full knowledge showing that you know that you are completely loved, completely accepted, completely in God's favor. Imagine that regret. I mean, let me ask you, do you live right now as if you at any time can see your heavenly lover? For some, he'll come as a judge. But as Isaiah 25 says, there'll be those who say, this is our God. We've waited for him. He's our lover. He loves us. And living in anticipation of that. So how would your life look if you were constantly delighted in knowing that you are already a winner in God's eyes, in God's book? You're already a winner. God isn't waiting for you to win. God isn't waiting for you to achieve a certain level of spirituality before He accepts you. No, He has won the battle for you. He has given it to you. You're now growing in it. You're already a winner. Imagine living your life like that. That's like two football teams that both get to play each other in the Super Bowl. Except this. Team number one should not have been there. They were regarded at the beginning of the season as the team with the least talent and the least opportunity or chance to win enough games to be in the Super Bowl. They were just a hopeless team. They were supposed to be last in the division, right at the bottom. No talent. The other team was supposed to win because it had all the talent. All the expectation, just a marvelous combination of players with experience, with talent, with everything it requires to make it to the Super Bowl. 
And then both of these teams get to the Super Bowl. And my question is, how would they approach that game? They'll approach it very differently, and here's why. The terrible team, or team one, the non-talent team, <laughs> that terrible team had an incredible season. I mean, everyone is drop-jawed about the fact that they actually made it to the Super Bowl. And that team, their approach to playing that final game hardly matters to them at all whether they win or lose. You know why? It's because they've already won. The verdict is already in that they have achieved what never has been achieved in history before. A team that bad makes it to the Super Bowl? Unbelievable. They already are in the record books. Their coach has already been declared the coach of the year. That team knows that though they don't have any talent, their teamwork has made the stuff of legend. Their hometown, the people who support them, and the whole nation will never forget what they have achieved, how they moved from being the underdog to the lead dog. Stunning. They are loved, they're respected, they're adored, they're honored. Their place in history is secure even before they play the final game. The other team is very different. They're expected to win, but they haven't yet yielded the promise. Their promise is to win the Super Bowl. They still have to play the game. They're nervous. They haven't made good on their promise. If they lose, they'll be spoken of and written about with great abusive, disparaging language. They would be the failure. They would get the egg on the face. And with that pressure on their minds, they come onto the, onto the field and begin to play. Two teams, totally different approaches. Do you know what? That first team is playing for fun. Is playing loosely. Is enjoying themselves. No pressure. They already have all the awards that they won. And that's why they will do so well in that game. The other team, the good team, they stressed. They tense. They don't know what's going to happen. If they lose, they lose everything. Everything depends on them winning. And as a result, they play poorly. That first team, this game is not a referendum on our value. We already have our value. The second team, this is a referendum that will make or break us. So I ask you, how do you play the game of life? How do you play that life? Remembering the wonder of what you were and the impossibility of you coming any further than where you were, but now the wonderment of where Jesus has brought you after doing what he has for you. Do you live uppermost in your mind your failures, your weakness, your impossibilities, or is uppermost in your mind the possibility, the power, the released power of Jesus Christ in your life? That'll make all the difference. Because then, Peter says, if you live like this, with the wonderment of Jesus on your mind. Look what he says in verse 11 this, on the screen. He says, Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, friends, you'll never, you'll never squeak into heaven. If squeaking into heaven is what you're hoping for, it's because you're thinking that you have to earn your way there and work hard enough. If only I can do enough, that will just get me and just squeak in. No, no, you're not going to squeak in. You're going to have a grand entrance. You know why? It's because Jesus had a grand entrance into heaven. And he had a grand entrance because he overcame sin and Satan and death. So that when he arrived at the portals of heaven after his ascension, there was a glorious reception. Read it in Psalm 110. And the promise is... That because you trust in His achievement, what He has done for you, there will be just as great a glorious and grand entrance for you into the kingdom with Jesus. Because you're only getting there because of Jesus, not because of what you have earned. 
You see, God spared no expense at the cross to get you saved. He will spare no expense to get you entered into heaven. That's how grand it will be for us. God's grace at the cross. God's grace at the cross grows godly living in the Christian and guarantees a grand entrance into his kingdom. Therefore, friends, let's remember the promise made that all who come in faith will find forgiveness at the cross. Let's remember often. Let's remember the wounds that heal. Let's remember he drained death's cup that you may enter in. Let's remember that. Let's remember often. When things get rough around you this week, remind yourself the king is coming. He's coming. He's on his way. That's good news. Let's pray. God in heaven, just like you've promised, I now want to say the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord smile upon you and give you his peace. Amen. We trust your relationship with God has been strengthened from what you have heard today. Please visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. May God give you His peace and joy.